The history of human migration into the Americas has long been shrouded in mystery. But in recent years, a convergence of fossil and genetic evidence has painted a new, compelling picture of our ancient ancestors. It was once thought that humans only entered North America after the last glacial maximum, when an ice-free corridor opened up between the Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheets. However, the discovery of ancient footprints in White Sands, New Mexico, dated to at least 23,000 years ago, along with genetic evidence suggesting that Native American ancestors were already in Beringia by 30,000 years ago, has fundamentally changed the timeline. The evidence is now clear. The first Americans were present south of the ice sheets before 25,000 years ago, meaning they must have entered the continent much earlier. But how did they get there? The answer likely lies in the untold story of the ancient Paleo-Siberians, the ancient Beringians, and the proto-Native Americans, as well as ancient technology, dugout canoes. If humans were already in Beringia by 30,000 years ago, as genetic evidence suggests, they must have been living in an environment that was at best harshly unforgiving and at worst nearly uninhabitable. The concept of a Beringian standstill, where populations remained genetically isolated for thousands of years before dispersing into the Americas, only makes sense if there was a viable means of survival. If humans migrated into the Americas before 25,000 years ago, the best time would be between 30,000 and 27,000 years ago, before the peak of the last glacial maximum. This period offered key environmental and geographic advantages for migration through the lost landmass of Beringia. Beringia was a wide, habitable landmass 30,000 to 27,000 years ago. The sea levels were already low, exposing the Bering Land Bridge. Beringia had a cold but not extreme climate, supporting mammoth steppe ecosystems that provided food and resources. Before the glacial maximum, more ice-free routes existed. After 26,500 years ago, the colder climate caused massive glacial expansion, making migration harder. The Cordilleran and Laurentide ice sheets in North America were smaller, possibly allowing migration into the interior before complete glacial blockage. Explorers could also have taken the Pacific coast route, as parts of the coastline remained ice-free. Archaeological evidence from sites such as the Yana rhinoceros horn site in Siberia dated to 31,600 years ago, demonstrates that people were already living in the Arctic long before the ancestors of Native Americans even reached Beringia. These ancient Paleo-Siberians, represented by genetic material from individuals found at Yana, were a distinct population, separate from both modern Europeans and East Asians. However, their genetic contribution is found in both the ancient Beringians and the proto-Native Americans suggesting a complex web of migrations and interbreeding events. The Yana site provides extraordinary insights into early human adaptation in extreme climates. Artifacts found at the site include a wide array of sophisticated tools made from bone, antler and stone, as well as evidence of mammoth hunting. A genetic bottleneck occurs when a population size is dramatically reduced, diminishing genetic diversity in future generations. If only a few individuals made it through Beringia and into America, they would have carried only a fraction of the genetic variety found in their northern predecessors. In reality, recent genetic research employing ancient DNA and present indigenous genomes suggest a single wave of migration into North America. Founder effects, a process in which a tiny founding group forms a new population, exacerbated the genetic impact. As groups spread out and established in new parts of the Americas, they brought with them only a portion of their ancestors' genetic diversity. Genetic drift, or random changes in gene frequencies, has changed various populations throughout time, resulting in distinct genetic profiles across the continent. Recent genomic studies back up this concept, indicating that American indigenous communities have substantial genetic ties to a small ancestral population that passed through the bottleneck at Beringia. The most prevalent Native American mitochondrial haplogroups exhibit patterns that suggest a population passing through a bottleneck before rapidly expanding throughout the American continents. The findings suggested that these populations descended from a single migratory wave that went through Beringia, supporting the theory that the land bridge served as a bottleneck. Meanwhile, the ancient Beringians, identified through the Upward Sun River site in Alaska, represent a crucial branch in this lineage. 
Genetic analysis shows that the ancient Beringians split from proto-Native Americans around 25,000 years ago, which means they had already made the crossing from Siberia into Beringia before the peak of the last glacial maximum. The Upward Sun River in Alaska site offers more than just genetic evidence. It also provides crucial archaeological data on early human life in Alaska. The site contained the remains of two infants buried in a ceremonial context, surrounded by ochre and grave offerings. This is one of the earliest known examples of formal burial practices in North America, indicating that these early peoples engaged in ritualistic behaviours and had established traditions surrounding death and the afterlife. These finds indicate that the ancient peoples had mastered survival strategies that allowed them to thrive in Arctic conditions, utilising advanced tool-making techniques and an extensive knowledge of their environment. All of this challenges the long-standing belief that humans only entered the Americas when ice-free corridors opened. If the proto-Native Americans and ancient Beringians were already living in Beringia before the last glacial maximum, they must have had some means of moving across landscapes dominated by ice sheets, massive rivers, and coastal environments. Given the sheer size of Beringia and the presence of resource-rich coastal ecosystems, the most logical conclusion is that they used some type of watercraft. For decades, mainstream archaeology has been resistant to acknowledge the role of watercraft in early human migrations. The Clovis First model, which dominated for much of the 20th century, envisioned a strictly overland migration through an ice-free corridor. But the Clovis First theory has now been thoroughly debunked after 50 years of being controlled by a group of archaeologists, who some called the Clovis Mafia. Now, it is time to debunk this even further and realize that the first Americans were some of the boldest ancient explorers who ever lived. It is just difficult for us to understand humans living on the edge of the world, crossing frozen tundras, navigating oceans in dugout canoes, and hunting megafauna as they did. In our modern world, it defies our understanding that humans would take such risks and how thrilling such an adventure would have been for them. The growing acceptance of the coastal migration hypothesis, which posits that early humans moved along the Pacific coast rather than through the interior, has forced researchers to reconsider the role of maritime travel. Native American groups along the Pacific Northwest, including those of British Columbia and Puget Sound, have long used dugout canoes made from western red cedar. This durable, rot-resistant wood was ideal for constructing seaworthy vessels, and it stands to reason that their ancestors, who lived in the same ecological region for tens of thousands of years, also utilized similar technologies. When proto-Native Americans expanded into cold environments like Beringia, they had to craft essential survival tools, including boats, clothing, and shelters. While all three required a mastery of materials and skills, constructing animal hide boats was significantly more challenging due to engineering complexity, waterproofing requirements, and durability factors. Therefore, dugout canoes would have been a much more feasible option. Western red cedar is one of the most easily workable woods for making dugout canoes, owing to its softness, lightweight nature, and resistance to decay. Even more significantly, driftwood from western red cedar and other large conifers would have been carried by ocean currents far north, allowing early humans in Beringia to access quality wood for boat construction, even in regions where such trees did not naturally grow. The presence of driftwood in Arctic and subarctic coastal areas is well documented, and many indigenous peoples have long relied on driftwood for building materials, tools, and fuel. Given this readily available resource, constructing boats would not have been an insurmountable challenge for early Beringian populations. And you can imagine that in a true wilderness 30,000 years ago, there would have been an almost unimaginable amount of driftwood washed up on the shores of ancient Alaska. Compared to the other survival challenges they faced, such as enduring extreme cold, constructing insulated shelters, hunting megafauna, and making sophisticated clothing from animal hides, carving a dugout canoe would have been a relatively straightforward task. These were people who had mastered living in sub-Arctic conditions, demonstrating remarkable ingenuity in hunting, crafting tools, and sustaining themselves in some of the harshest climates on Earth. The ability to carve and hollow out a log using stone tools or fire-hardening techniques would have been well within their capabilities, particularly given their established proficiency in working with wood and bone. 
motivation for movement to the south would have been high. Beringia was cold, though it provided enough resources to sustain populations for thousands of years. Yet the promise of warmer climates to the south, with richer ecosystems, greater food abundance, and a more stable environment, would have been an irresistible draw for naturally adventurous people. Why then do some researchers continue to dismiss the idea that early humans in Beringia used boats? The reluctance stems from an outdated bias that assumes that ancient populations lacked sophisticated seafaring skills. This is despite the fact that Homo sapiens successfully reached Australia by at least 60,000 years ago, a journey that required crossing open water. If humans could navigate to Australia using primitive boats, there is no reason to believe they were incapable of traversing the coastal waterways of Beringia. The dismissal of early boat use is not just an oversight. It is a dangerously unscientific viewpoint that restricts our ability to understand the full complexity of human migration. Early human societies were not stagnant. They were explorers, pioneers who took risks and moved in search of better opportunities. Their journey southward was not simply one of necessity, but also of curiosity and ambition, traits that have defined humanity since we first ventured out of Africa over a million years ago. Thanks for watching and commenting.